one, the number seven one uh, dot com and then forward slash glossary, G L O S S A R Y, and those terms in, are explained in there. So, when in doubt, just go to futurestrader seventy one dot com. Uh, the glossary is also a button on the front page, so you know what those terms are. Essentially, there are uh, just a handful of key things that I abbreviate and look for. Uh, an LVN stands for a low volume node. This is a price or range of prices that have little to no volume that traded there historically. Uh, I'm charting I'm charting volume not like you normally do, like we see here on uh, John's charts where you're looking at volume per bar. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I do that as well, but I'm charting volume mainly as a uh, horizontal on the horizontal scale. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at how much traded, how many contracts traded, traded per price, uh, and I track those to the tick. How long? How far back do you go? Because when you're looking at a horizontal line, how far back do you usually go to kind of measuring that volume? So what I do is I, I go out on a daily chart and I look at the last big swing low. Okay. And I start my chart there. The last big swing low that I'm working with right now that we've been in for a year now is October 9th, 2013. So I'm pulling all of the volume per price uh, traded since that period. Uh, not not a lot of software can do that, but it's it's just important to see where the market has traded a lot and where it has kind of um, run through and not traded much. It, that that gives us an idea of how much interest there is in various zones of the of the entire range since uh, since last October. The range since last October goes from sixteen eleven fifty. And this is adjusted for the December contract to 2012.75, wow. so about 400 points in the last year, uh, and and I'm just tracking where the volume is, uh, the high volume is, which is the high volume node HVN. You see it. The, oh, I misspelled it at 18.10. It's uh, HVN. The C in front of those, the HVN and LVN. The C stands for composite, which means that the composite is basically uh, referring to all of the data in the chart going back to that day. So we have volume that takes place on the daily chart, like right now we're developing volume. The high volume price of today is uh, 83.75. Uh, so that's that's a daily volume node. Uh, but but then there's also a composite, which means all all prices all t all um, all prices going back, all volume going back to when the chart started at the last swing, which was October 9th, 2013. So when you're looking at a C-level profile, uh, it's big. It's, it means that it covers a large uh, amount of time and a whole lot of volume. Uh, that 1850 that I, that I write on there, that it's uh, thick chop, that is the most valuable price or the most traded price uh, in the last year. That's a price where participants really, really got in there and and did their thing. Actually, <coughs> that node gets fat from 1853 all the way down to about 1844 and a quarter. And, and I'm tracking that volume. The volume at that price at 1850 is 853,151 contracts, 853,151 contracts. So you can see the C level, um, when I say CLVN or CHVN or CVPOC, uh, uh, volume point of control, uh, those are big, big levels. The smaller levels are just low volume, LVN, HVN, VPOC, that means it happened on a daily chart. Then there's the MC. LVN. It's a microcomposite where what I'm doing is taking, let's say, uh, last week we dropped and we made a low at 1813 and we cycled back. So the best way to see this actually is to, to share my screen here. Maybe I, I'll do that. Yeah, great. I, I think uh, it's better to, you know, picture uh, spells a thousand words. 
Okay, we'll bring that over here. Okay. Okay. So this is my daily chart. Each one of these bars represents a day's worth of trading and it's day session only. I don't include the overnight, but I use I use the overnight information before the market starts, but I don't include the overnight volume. It doesn't affect us that much because uh, it's relatively low to the session to the day session. The overnight volume represents less than ten percent generally of the day session's volume. Um, and what you have here, the blue on the right, that's the composite. This this stuff here is basically an accumulation of all of the volume that's ever traded going back from the date shown right there, uh, October 9th of 2013. And so if I scroll back and show you which swing we're trading, I'm basically selecting the swing low from 1611.50 and it includes <clears throat> everything up to the all-time high of 2012.75 in the December contracts. So this is this is a big picture view of what's going on. And the volume represented on the right is the volume that occurred at every single price, every tick of price. And you can see here the 1850. See how much volume there is? There's it's yep. it's sticking out. That's that's basically the most valuable price since then. There are other peaks, which I'll discuss when we get there, 1759 and a quarter. Then we have one that we talked about quite a bit in the 63 quarter area, 60 to 63, 1963 quarter area. But the most valuable price is 1850. Why? Because we spent the better part of the first quarter of this year trading at that price. We did a lot of trading in that area. So we've moved away from the most valuable price in the chart or price range in the chart We've rallied, we've consolidated, and then we've come back to revisit uh, to revisit these prices. We went to 1813 last week, uh, a nice, nice big doji that we put in there. We opened right where we closed, mm -hmm. and then the day after that, uh, which was Thursday, we closed right at 1850, just confirming that. And what I said for the for that day is we're likely to chop all around 1850 and that's basically what we got we op we gapped down we ran up stopped at 1850 ran through uh, to about 6975 and then we came all the way back to 1850 and just traded there for the session Friday we gapped up <clears throat> into these two days when I have the market when I have two days overlapping each other <clears throat> excuse me those days are considered in balance and when they're in balance, I combine the volume for those days with this yellow bar, this yellow chart. That's what I call an MC or a micro composite. So you have three components. The composite, which gives you all the volume all the time for everything on the chart. Then you have the micro composite, which is a, a handful of days. And the criteria for selecting those handful of days is that they're overlapping each other. Mm -hmm. So these two days were overlapping each other. So I looked at the micro composite and it's telling me 74.75, 1874.75 is the most valuable price there. Once we broke lower, I could not use this composite anymore. But once we came back into it, now I can extend this out. And now I can see that there's a really important area that, that's been poorly tested here between 1865 and 1862, which I have on that chart that I sent you. Uh, and that's where that comes from. The expectation for today, in fact, was for us to, to test up to about 1882, roll over, and come back down to 1865 and test this area here. 1865 represents the low of the 13th and 14th uh, of last week. Once we put in this uh, bar on Friday and we're trading within the value, within the range of these two other days, I extend this out and I include the volume for these days and it shows us that 1882 over the last four, five days, 1882 is the most valuable price or the most traded price and then there's a valley in between these two um, distributions, between these two uh, uh, groups. And so if we break below 1865 to 1862, then I expect 1850 to be dominant again. Mm -hmm. Notice that in the last two days, if I, if I zoomed into these two days here mm -hmm. and just looked at them by themselves, you'll notice that the, val the most traded price in those two areas, <clears throat> 1849, 
See that? 1849, yep, yep. pretty much in line with the all time most valuable price. So, when that proves that when the market comes back to an area of high volume, what does it do? It makes another area of high volume. It yeah. just trades the heck out of it. That's why it's important. Okay? Mm -hmm. Excellent. That was really good, you know, especially your micro uh, levels there. Yeah. Good explanation so, on that. So, that's, you know, that's the, <clears throat> those are the main categories. Those are the, um, the, the micro, there's the composite, there's a micro composite, which is just several days as opposed to all days, and then there, there's the, um, there's the, uh, the the profile that's created each day, which I'm monitoring. So depending on the time frame I'm looking at, because uh, the market's really just a bunch of different time frames combined, you kind of the first thing you got to do is define what is my time frame. It doesn't matter if you're trading stocks or futures or forex or whatever the the most confusing thing to traders that i've seen is when they're listening to a guy who's trading on the daily time frame and they're sitting here scalping you know taking 15 mm -hmm. or 20 second scalps and their bias is all messed up because the on the, on the daily you might be trending up but on the mm -hmm. on a smaller time frame yep. you might the market might be pushing down yeah you know? exactly exactly we talk about that all the time just the multiple time frames making sure you have them all lined up for you yeah you, you have yeah, something so underlining key. well anyway go Absolutely. ahead so i mean so, now we have uh do you th what do you th what do you think the overall you know i know we were looking at possibly this just being a pullback in the market continuing its uh merry old way higher do you see that in the cards uh, I personally think that this is a pullback for uh, another probe down. I don't think that it's uh, that you know the party's over for the bulls. I think this is a temporary setback, like we've seen a lot of. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this this is this is what you and I talk about uh, all the time on the show. Like, man, uh, this 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 market needs to kind of. Um, you know, clean up a little bit, do some spring cleaning, push, squeeze a few, you know, the weak hands out, and then give more opportunities for the buyers to step in. To me, what we had here, and this is a very noisy chart, let me go to a higher time frame. And let me, while you're doing that, just to mention, um, there was a lot of focus on, all right, that key, key correction amount, 10%, 10%. Everyone's looking at that 10%. A couple people in our room, and I didn't measure it out, said we pretty much hit that 10% to the uh, to the dollar. I mean, is it, did we get close to a 10% correction on the S&P? On the index, it came out at 9.885%. All right. From the high to the low, that's it's it's pretty close. I mean, we're definitely not uh, rocket scientists, but yeah. <laughs> it's pretty darn close. Um, I, I'm not sure why it turned at 18.13, but boy, did they buy that up yeah. uh, when it got down there. So there, was, there, there must be something there that's, uh, that caused that frenzy, uh, that buying frenzy. But if you look at this chart, I wish I could draw on here, but what, what you have here is a, um, is a market that kind of rolled over and, and moved down in kind of a balanced uh, in a balanced way down to 1918 and a quarter and it was doing okay the real move started at 1964 with the high of 1964 which is the 8th of, uh, of October on the Wednesday and we had what is what I would call an impulsive move down and this impulsive move generally when you have an impulsive move which is a very um, high um, high range move all of a sudden generally what you have is a pullback to something less than the 50 percent and then a continuation so an extension move and then the market finally corrects then you have a corrective move generally so you'll see that on uh, a very very small time frame you'll see that on uh, weeklies you'll see that on dailies generally when you have news come out and the market pushes hard it tends to pull back hard, generally holds the 50% or better, and if it does, then generally it has the late, you know, the late buyers if it's a rally or the late sellers if it's a sell-off uh, kind of hopping in. And I think this, I'm reading this as a potential pullback uh, for a higher time frame, uh, for a higher time frame to, uh, to, to go to, to retest lower. Um, now here's the thing, 
with that. Um, shorting on a bigger time frame, this market is essentially uh, tantamount to um, taking, digging your heels and taking a position against politicians and against the central banks every time you do that. Uh, we're coming into an election in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and and you know somebody somewhere could just as easily you know if the market was able to move under its own power, uh, we I would I would be more willing to bet in the longer term, meaning over the next week or two, that we take out this 1813 by at least a few points down to maybe 1800 or 180150, which is the next level down I have here on this chart. Um, but given given the fact that there's so much meddling with the market, at any given point you might have the Fed coming in and saying, "You know what? We're not we're not going to stop buying. We're not going to taper yeah. this last taper. We're going to hang on for one more month, and that's all the market needs to run up 100 points." Yeah. Um, so there's there's always that. You're always fighting that when you're a bear. Uh, so you know those who are perma bears, those who look at the markets. Who look at the market says, "Oh my God, you know this is totally inflated." And look at how things are going around the economy. Look at the geopolitics. Look at all the problems. The market's way, way, way overinflated. Those guys have really had to bleed for years and years and years. Uh, and generally, they pile on as the as the drop happens to add the positions, only to see uh, mm -hmm. their initial profits evaporate very, very quickly as the market pops up in a V bottom. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we've had, you know. I, you and I have seen it. Heck, uh, we've been talking for three years, and yep. we've seen it happen so many times where the market drops and it looks like the end of the world, and then it crushes mm -hmm. all the all the shorts on the way up. You know, and, you, you wonder when they're going to get smart about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's you know, we we this is this is a substantial correction. We did yeah. have incredible volume last week uh, compared to uh, prior. Uh, you know the prior periods, the prior year or so. But is it is it a dramatic sell-off? Is it a no. flash crash? Is it, you know, 2008? Heck no. There's not nowhere even close. In fact, the volatility that we had last week, what it just gave me flashbacks to when I first started trading uh, futures uh, in 2000, 2001, 2002. Uh, it's just it was that fluid all the time. Uh, except now we call it kind of crazy when it when it when the VIX jumps up to 30. But um, overall, here's here's a market that I expected today to drop down to 1865 and kind of take out this island that we created on Friday. And for whatever reason, despite the terrible earnings that IBM came yeah. up with this morning, <laughs> and uh, not to mention uh, in Europe, SAP and uh, Philips which are just ginormous components of the German economy and a German DAX index, uh, they both bombed. And here we are pushing highs uh, right up against Friday's highs, you know. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fine with this. I'm fine with the move uh, higher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, cannot, you cannot have, I, I, I know it's hard for people, and I say it a lot of times, and I feel <clears throat> like I'm pissing people off, but... It's just be detached, you know. It yeah. doesn't mean that you shouldn't care. You should care about how you trade. Being right. detached doesn't mean you should be careless. Don't mistake. Those are two separate concepts. But be detached from what you think the market should do. Because if you start to say it needs to, it yeah. must, it should, yep. 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 you are locking your mindset. It's, yep. it's, it's neuro-linguistic programming. You're locking your mind into an idea and will your your eyes will actually ignore this has been shown your eyes will actually ignore the information that contradicts that that tells yeah. you dude you're wrong uh, you'll just ignore that and i see traders do that all the time so that brings me you're trading go ahead yeah no i just just to hit on this point before i forget it but it's an interesting point now for your traders and the people that you uh, you know you, we, when we discuss the markets and you see the market do something opposite of what you expected do you, you find yourself as a professional trader to say, all right, you know what, this is not working t towards my plan. Let me step back and observe why it's doing this. Well, let this play out, and then I want to get something, you know. Could we, you know, I could see <clears throat> a lot of people expecting something and continue to, you know, press that trade, and it continues to go against them. And uh, if something's not working like you expect, 
then it's just a good enough reason. I mean, you don't have to be in the market every single day. I, I, I kind of stress that. Sometimes it, it's good good days to be out of the market if it's not acting the way you expect it to act. Right. Uh, well, you know, I could I, personally to me, uh, yeah. John, it's it's actually better. Yeah. I. You know, it sounds really arrogant or something, but it's great when I'm really wrong. Like if I if I come into the day, and I expect the market to sell off, um, and I basically you know draw my lines on there, my sandbox that I'm going to play in, and I say you know I'm expecting this to push up to mm -hmm. 1882, the most valuable price of Friday, and then I expect sellers to step back in and push it down to 65 or so. Uh, that's the expectation. It, it, I'm, I'm thinking that it might do that with a higher probability. If that probability is crushed by buyers, yeah. it's just I have so much more confidence, just just plain confidence in the opposite direction, in my second idea. Mm -hmm. So that was, my primary idea got crushed, and it generally results in a and a decent loss, but I have I am so much more comfortable trading from the other side, and you know, and that's not just me. Not that I want to compare myself to uh, Jesse Livermore or something, but one of the most captivating things from reminiscences of a stock operator is when he watched this big time uh, trader at a bucket shop. Uh, he, he heard a rumor that somebody was buying up a stock, I forget, maybe a rail stock or something. And he, uh, so he sends his clerk and he says, go ahead and sell like 6,000 shares or a couple thousand shares. And the clerk runs off and he tells him, observe how they're, how they're mm -hmm. uh, absorbed by the market. Tell me how they trade. Uh, and then the clerk runs off, makes the trade, comes back, and he says they were taken right up. And he says, good. Now go ahead and buy me whatever it was. I'm going to make up a hundred thousand shares of that stock, right? Because he now he tested to see that the opposite idea uh, is got absorbed. Like there's truly a buyer yeah. who just took all those shares right away. So now he's a lot more. The idea that he would sell is is shot, and so now he's a lot more confident in the buy side because he he has confirmed that there is bedrock under the under the price, mm -hmm. right? So he can build. He can build on it. Uh, it's kind of like it, it's on that same idea that if if my, if what I want if what I expected to see given the probabilities that I work with does not happen, and and worse yet, it gets crushed. It's just it's so much it's it's so yeah, much it's easier. A, it's a to great just go signal. In the other direction. Yeah, <laughs> it's a signal. Yeah. It's everything's a signal. Yeah. So, anyway, so I, I don't know. We've well, got a question I, in the room for you. Um, yeah. We'll hit you up on this. FT, what, do you, what are your thoughts about looking at the DAX during the S&P pre-market, or U.S. pre-market trade, looking at the foreign markets? I would, the DAX is a lot, is very uh, thin, and it's extremely, um, it's just very high powered. The thing with the DAX is it's only 30 stocks. And those stocks are concentrated in the German market, which mm -hmm. is highly efficient. And so a lot of people can um, can recreate that basket and can trade it. The better uh, the better indication, in my opinion, is to look at the Euro stocks 50, which span across all European markets and have a broader uh, foundation of sectors and so forth to trade the S and P. I I've never advocated trading one product by looking at the chart of another or by looking at another market you can get yourself in a lot of trouble uh, doing that because the spread between those markets or the correlation between those markets is not fixed one day you might see the euro stocks leading and you might do well uh, in the S&P and then another day uh, you, the S&P will lead, and you'll find yourself at exactly on the exact opposite side. If you looked at the, you know, the the S&P would lead on a rally. Let's say the Euro stocks will start moving. You will buy the S&P, and that'll be the the it'll be already extended in that direction because the Euro stocks are delayed. It's a it's a tough way to trade, uh, but at least I don't know what charting you use. Um, but I would chart the spread. I would do like just a simple chart of ES divided by the euro stocks and before you start trading just look at how that relationship is is it is it trading like it was yesterday or is it tr is the spread tr trending or whatever and you're getting into more sophisticated stuff but uh Tommy, you know you pushed this on the wrong thing I did. yeah but if you're going to do that you need to do that you know 
You need to do that appropriately. You need to know what the relationship is between the two products. All right, and then you got another question in coming in from Papa in the room. FFT, are you looking for this to get much higher than Friday's highs today? Uh, this the, we're putting we're starting to build a weak high to Friday. Friday's high was really decent. It went up to 91.75 and it found sellers pretty good uh, right off right off the bat. It, it lingered there for a very very short time, so that was uh, that was an excess high. The fact that we're going back to it and we're about two points below uh, Friday's high tells me that this high is weak. There's a big level here at 87.75. Uh, right here it's a low it's a composite low volume node I suspect that we'll be stuck here for a little bit uh, but the way this is shaping up as long as we don't get under 82 uh, the 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 uh, Friday high is likely to be taken out the other thing is um, the other stat that's still in play that has not been broken yet is the overnight stat so there's a statistic out there uh, that the overnight high, the, the night session or the extended session high, and or low, extended session high or low, is likely to be taken out during the day 96 or 97 percent of the time. Okay? And we have not tested either one of those. Usually we take those out right from the start, and neither one of those have been tested. This could be a day where neither one gets broken. Uh, but that gives us some room on the upside to 93.50. It tested, meaning either touched or exceeded. Uh, so that gives us a target of 93.50 if you're long. That's off the table below 82, though. All right. Okay? Yeah, sounds good. Um, FT, uh, of course, stage five trading. And a great segment today. I'm going to record. I actually recorded this. A lot of people asked for me to record your segment. So we did get that recorded, and I'll send that out. Very cool. And um, great, great to hear from you. I, I it sound like you got a little cold there. Yeah, actually, I uh, went to a wedding ceremony uh, on Saturday, which was outdoors. outdoors. It was like 46 degrees. Yeah. Um, I want to put this my webpage up just so people know how to spell it. Future Trader 71. Just go into glossary right here. Yep. And you will see, you will have all those terms in here. CHVN, CLVN, all these terms are listed here just just in case you're confused when you listen to the recording, okay? Excellent job, FT. Thanks a lot. And Thanks for we'll, having me on. We'll talk to you this week. Take care. All right, take Bye. care. All right, well, let's get this back over here. Let me stop the recording here. As FT71, Stage 5 Trading, and Future Trader 71, Twitter name, 